You're listening to Thunder Quack Podcast Network. there and welcome back to force perspectives i am your host michael cohen and joining me as always my favorite star wars medium oh joe hogan you are you just live life in the fast lane with those compliments sir let me tell oh, you oh you know you know i i hey listen joe mm-hmm. all right this is the uh, last that's episode. all I do on this podcast. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up and listen. <laughs> I I this is the last episode before the end of October. So mm-hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and just give myself a plug for uh for all my art over on uh on Instagram, TikTok, uh Blue Sky now. Uh um because Twitter is 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 dying the death. Um hopefully, hopefully. Hopefully, I don't know. I, but uh, yeah, I've been posting Star Wars characters every day in the month of October, uh, and uh, and they are all in fact for sale. Um, some of them have already sold. Some of them are gone. Let's see who's who's sold. Leia sold. Mm. I I Din and Grogu are sold. Han Solo is sold. I I. Jackie and Darth Vader. Those ones are all gone. Um, oh, and Ray is also gone. Nice. Um, so there are still lots of great characters uh, that are left. Um, man, no, nobody, nobody's bought Luke. Nobody's bought Kanan. And I think that I did a pretty good job on both of those. Uh, yeah. I think I, you I'm, did a pretty good job on all of them, but that's just me. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I've had any, any, stinkers this year um so far because every year i feel like i always end up with one that's like not so great um ahsoka is pretty good let's see let's see vernestra i don't really care about the character that much but but she turned out great uh poe dameron i i think i did really well cal kestis is one of my favorites that i did this year (laughs) um yeah, my Ben Solo, I'm not like totally psyched on, but he's all right. Oh no, I do have a stinker. My Yoda's not great. This oh, Yoda's no. not great. Did I not see Yoda? Hold on, let me see. I don't. He's like fine. It. He's fine. I just don't really like the pose. Uh, it's. It, I didn't. I, I don't know. I don't think I nailed the pose. Uh, yeah. Uh, I. I can't believe that 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 the KVS and ND five, uh, are still available. Somebody that's, needs to to pick crazy. up both of those. Um, but I just did Kira yesterday and realized that like, it's the first time I've ever drawn that character. Um, and, uh, that's kind of wild cause I love solo so much, but, uh, uh, she was a lot of fun to draw. So, oh, um, good. I didn't see her yet. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I head over to Archangel Wolf on basically any social media platform that people use. Um, I, let's see, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, Blue Sky, uh, all of those. Archangel with a K and Wolf with a U because I'm uh, cool and unique. Um, but mostly just like that's just like SEO sort of thing. I've maintained that because it's like it's easy to <laughs> it's easy to corner the market. Nobody else is grabbing those uh, those those usernames on social media. So <laughs> I've always stuck with it. But uh, yeah, dude, go, I didn't go see check po that stuff before out. now. Poe's awesome. Poe came great. Yeah, I I think really the poll one turned out pretty go. good. I made a switch about halfway through the month uh, of of basically doing the sketches in digital and then transferring them and then mm. doing doing everything uh, uh, in ink. And I think that it's um I think it's a better workflow. Uh, that's that's what I did for a lot of my sketch cards because it's just it's it's nicer to have that control without ruining the paper. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's the thing is it's just like the 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 constant, you know, erasing yeah. and sketching or whatever. But also it's just it started with ND5, right? Because I I liked the sketch that I did, but his proportions were way off. Mm. So I, I I I I tossed it into Procreate and just did some some little transform tweaks on it um just to fix them up and then and then used my light 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 box. It's not really a box, it's just an LED like panel basically um which is the best thing ever oh my god dude being able to just like <laughs> like whip out this little like like i don't know it's like two millimeters thick it's a uh, like just just a little bit over an eight and a half by 11 sheet and uh uh it's perfect it's just like the thing just lights right up uh beautifully brightly uh with the usb and and um it's man what a game changer for me of like being able to 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 just light box things without having a kid man as a kid i wanted a light box so bad like when i was like uh like like 12 13 year old i was like i'm gonna do animation and and i but i need a light box to do it and back then a light box was a a fluorescent tube (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right like at the back of like an angled box with a piece of like glass or plexiglass uh on it and they were like hundreds of dollars um back then back in like back in like you know the late 90s early 2000s like like two three hundred dollars to get a light box like if you walked into a, an art supply store and saw one so that was never a reality for me but now it's like oh yeah we just took some plastic and s- stuffed some some really really high powered LEDs in it and it's nothing like it's it 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 I think I spent like maybe $30 on it it's fantastic mm. um but the ability to just like have that in my back pocket to be able to to pull out and uh and do that is so awesome and then you combine that with the iPad and Procreate and all of that technology it's like yeah, yeah, it's uh, uh, it's these are all such massive game changers in terms of being able to actually like execute the art that I want to do. Uh, but I I head over to my social media and and you know give me the follow and uh, uh, and check out the art because because there's a lot of cool stuff there. I everything is it's, uh, man by the time people are listening to this there will only be a few characters left um but if you do want to get them for cheaper i uh, you can pre-order them and they're five bucks cheaper when you pre-order them if not they're they're thirty dollars um after i've completed them that said i'm terrible about then going in and updating <laughs> the site so i know right now i think i'm about like three or four behind um but uh, i fyi I, though one just sold because uh, I saw ND5 was still there. I was like, mm, no, he's coming home with me. Okay. Uh, coming with me. Excellent. So even um, less remain now. That's, yeah, there you go. I Hurry up so, while supplies last. Uh, the, like, there's one of each, right? So, um, yeah. I, I, Archangel Wolf, go check it out. And, uh, and, and, and you obviously, well, I hope you do after that. You obviously ship outside of Canada, right? Like not. Just yeah. 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 Inside yeah. Canada. yeah. Yeah. I'll ship anywhere. I'll ship anywhere. Um, yeah. And it's the cheapest you'll get a commission from me. Uh, I, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, if there's a character that you would have commissioned, it's the cheapest way to do it. Um, I've got, there's a, there's a couple of Thunderquack listeners that are, that are, uh, awesome supporters that have at this point bought m- multiple pieces, um, when I do these and, uh, and, and it's always appreciated. Um, but it's awesome. It's like, they, they have like little collections of my art. Um, that's it for that. Uh, I, I just wanted to plug it. I just wanted to make sure before the end of the month, before I move on to other things that's, uh, that, that I got a nice plug right up front for that. I, I, on this episode though, do you have anything to plug? Do you, do you want to plug any art? I would love to everything. I'm you're, you're on still, everything. I think the, I think secret. the soonest I will be able to plug anything is next month. Okay. Um, if my math is correct, otherwise it's going to be like may, uh, maybe February. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. I, I, Joe's always working on awesome stuff though, just so that everybody knows that Joe is, Joe's always got something incredible cooking. So I, I, yeah. Um, 
Cool. Well, stay tuned because I'm sure that as soon as you can share, you will. And I will be a big map. Yeah. <laughs> uh, awesome. Let's get let's get into our topic uh, for this for this episode. And it, this one's kind of a weird one, but it's it's something that I've been wanting to talk about. And I think actually um, in the last little bit, it's been it's really been on my mind. Uh, and that is the topic of uh, of what is the best medium what's the best uh format for star wars and i just to explain that a little bit more and then joe i'm gonna let you uh, chime in with your opinion on this first um it so so what i'm talking about is like you know movies versus tv shows versus animated television comic books video games um by you know short form long form sort of like what what does uh books i I can't believe i left books off um Hmm. what what format is best suited for telling star wars stories because i know i have a lot of opinions on this i think you and i are pretty aligned on this so i don't think there will be a lot of arguing in this episode Hmm. but i but i think that there's still a lot to discuss about you know sort of the the, the benefits and um, the drawbacks of, of one medium over the other. Um, I, but yeah, I know, I mean, I know for a fact that we kind of align on, on what the most important ones are, what the best ones are, but, mm. um, but I'm, I'm kind of curious to know how you feel about some of it, because I feel like I have a slightly controversial take on this, which oh, is that movies okay. films are far from the best as, <laughs> as a matter of fact, they're pretty low on my ranking of all the things that I just wow, listed. Okay. I, I think that actually the films, um, although, although obviously that's how, you know, the franchise was established. Um, I don't think the films are why star Wars flourishes. And I certainly don't think that the films are what, um, what have given them staying power. I, 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 I think that, that there are other mediums that have done that, but I want, I want to hear from you first. Um, what do you, let's start, let's start sort of with the bottom. Like, what do you think is, is the, the medium that's sort of the least suited or, or I don't know, maybe even not, not even least suited, but just the one that's never really been taken advantage of. Like what, what, how do you feel, um, about that? I don't know what the bottom is. I, I really honestly, like, I just kind of thought about the top ones. So, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I guess I'll I'll just go through my order real quick. Uh, so animation, right? Television animation is, is yeah. my number one. My number two, which I think I have more to say about. So I might I might just let you kind of go for the animation stuff and talk about my number two myself. Uh, video games. Mm-hmm. Video games, I think, is is one of the best ones. I also really, really, really love Dark Horse era Star Wars comic books. I think they yeah. absolutely crush it. Um, I'm not a big fan of the Marvel ones, like the new ones, yeah. um, or the. I mean, honestly, I haven't read the the original Marvel ones, so like, I just I don't know. Uh, I assume not because they've never really been that well loved in the community from what i understand like i've just heard what i've heard and but i never really checked it out for myself so i can't say um probably put the films in after that um i do like the novels so the novels might be under the films what's left what am i missing what did i leave out i tv shows uh, as opposed to to film right so so short form versus long form I guess. right um I might I might put the TV shows above novels, but still under the films. Um, and then is that it? Is there anything else? I mean, like, you know, bubblegum wrappers and, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, um, movie tie in commercial campaigns. And, you know, like there's yeah, there there yeah. there have been very, very many formats for Star Wars over the years. Sure, um sure. newspaper comic strip uh, is is one that I actually okay. like would put in there seriously. Okay. But um what about like tabletop yeah. gaming? Because weren't there like a lot of Yeah. 
RPG. Yeah, that's a really like that's that made. Yeah, that's a really great point because there is actually a lot of like actual world building and storytelling that mm. happened through the West End games stuff back in the day before there were really a lot of novels. Mm. Um, I can't place those. I never played them, so I I don't know. Yeah, like, I, I don't yeah. know that. I I, I mean, that. I can talk about it a little bit because um, okay. I I've I've played them a little bit, but but mostly I know them historically as like okay. the places where a lot of the information that that became canon started. Um, uh, Pablo Hidalgo, uh, back in the day when he was a more public individual before you know uh, people turned into assholes on the internet um and and like really targeted him as the problem with star wars i will never understand that because pablo is a wonderful beautiful human being and has like dedicated his life to just talking about star wars and and consistency and and canon and continuity and stuff like that like like that's that's kind of his jam and i i somehow that made him a target i mean like every because every time that continuity was broken by one thing or another um i at a certain point people started blaming pablo as if as if he was making the decisions yeah. right and it's like no he's kind of like him and and like Lee lin chi right they're kind of like lore keepers at Lucasfilm, um, they're the people that, that other people go to when they're writing a story and go like, okay, so we're thinking of doing this. Is there something already? Right. Um, at which point, you know, um, I, I, th- these, these, these individuals within the story group will be like, ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So there's this, 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 and this, do any of those fit? Right. Um, and so they'll help with, with story stuff in that way, but they're not the ones determining, you know, what's in continuity and what's not um but yeah i mean like really around the beginning of the disney era everybody started going after pablo and and i that's that's such an injustice because because he's he's put so many hours into curating incredible things like the visual guides and i i you know like sort of like the the essential guide type books um uh which i would say is like another sort of like separate from novels, right? The, the, um, <clears throat> the, the source books similar to, uh, things like, like role-playing games, right? Like the, like essential guide to vehicles or the essential guide to weapons and technology and, um, essential guide to aliens. Like if you, if you look at those old books from the nineties, uh, there's so much, so much lore in those that gets sort of collected but also elaborated on in some instances right like the essential guide to to vehicles uh, i think that they're separate books i think the essential guide to starships and the essential guide to vehicles are two separate books yeah but if you look at those so much of the history of of incom uh sign our fleet systems uh the quad drive yards all of that stuff is like canonized through those books right because once those books exist um which i would be i would be curious to know what the what the genesis of those was because i think if i had to guess they were probably originally started as internal documents for lucasfilm for once they started doing novels and comics and whatnot and and somebody was like hey we need to keep some of this stuff a little bit more consistent than we have been um because if you go back to the old school like Han Solo adventures, the Lando Calrissian stuff, um, Splinter of the Mind's Eye, this all of the stuff pre uh, Timothy Son, right? Um, mm. You go back to that stuff, and it's all over the place. The Marvel comics from back in the day, like it's everywhere, right? Like, like people were just riffing and doing their own thing, and consistency was out the door. Um, and so I, I I imagine that in the early '90s there was a there was a little bit of an effort internally to be like, hey, can we can we actually have some like hard and fast rules about some of this stuff, like who manufactures X wings and where they came from for the rebels and all that sort of stuff. And and I think that you see that start to to you know um, take the form of those essential guides. Um, and then the essential guides are hugely popular. And so they, it starts to turn into another thing and they do more and more and more of them. Um, the essential chronology is the only one that I actually own, but I, uh, uh, cause those, cause a lot of those like, uh, predate my ability to 
go pick up books at a bookstore myself, um, you know, with money that I earned from a job. I, so yeah, I don't, I don't have any of the, of the older ones. I would love it if they reissued some of that stuff, if they would like, they do the legends books reissues. If they, if they did those, I don't care if they're incorrect now. Like, I don't care if, if those books are now, I, I, you know, like, like outdated and, and, and other things have come along is like, no, just reprint them as they were because they're such great books. But, but in the modern era, Pablo is really responsible for a lot of the, the, the visual guide stuff. And, and, um, and those visual guides are another massive source of what is considered canon lore. Right. Mm. I, I would say Rise of Skywalker is an incomplete film without the visual guide. There there are things in the visual guide that explain story points in that film <laughs> that do not make any sense, right? Really? So much of the Sith Eternal and Exegol, because so much of it was cut from the movie, right? Um and and footage exists like these things were shot these things were actually intended to be in the film um i saw a post on on uh, i don't remember if it was twitter or blue sky but um i saw a post from someone the other day that was you know talking about um oscar isaac uh, and his attitude towards the film and this guy being like like you know i think that i think that people have really i uh, i you know, overblown his, his reaction to the film. Like, like, like they, like, like they have a weird opinion of what Oscar Isaac thinks of the film. And he's got, he's citing this, this, um, this interview from like March of 2019. Well, in March of 2019, they hadn't even done the reshoots yet. Right. So in March of 2019, Oscar Isaac probably had one opinion of that movie. And then by the time that he actually saw it and then was doing press for it, I think of the, uh, I, the, the junket that they did at Disneyland, um, at galaxy's edge, I, I, where they've got like the millennium Falcon in the background and all of that. Um, and this is like right before galaxy's edge started. No, I guess it would have already been doing previews earlier that year, earlier in 2019. Um, but, uh, yeah, like they, they, <laughs> they did this whole, the whole the whole cast up on stage in front of the Millennium Falcon sort of thing, and uh, I I they they ask the question of like how do you think fans are going to react to this movie or whatever, and it goes around and everybody's giving like these like no word answers, right? And um and Oscar's answer is very much at the time like when you see it before you see the movie, you're like it's you know like kind of like oh it's going to blow people's minds. And then when you look back at that after having seen the movie, you realize that like his he's kind of like biting his tongue a little bit like his his uh, his response is like, mm, yeah, people are going to have things to say. Um, <laughs> I because like I think Oscar knows what a good movie is. He's He's got a pretty decent track record um, and knows when he's in a stinker. Um, which he's also done a few of those as well. So uh, X-Men Apocalypse being one of them. Um, so yeah, like the dude knows a good movie versus a bad movie when he sees one. And and I think that he was fully aware, but I, I, but it's so funny because like so much of that stuff that they originally shot doesn't make it into the movie, but then Pablo like included a lot of that background in, in the visual guide. If you've ever cracked that thing open, like there's, there's a lot. There's a lot about the 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 Sith Eternal. There's a lot about um about sort of like the state of the resistance, which I think was a larger storyline um before they really like recut that movie and zeroed in on it just kind of being about Rey and Kylo. Like mm. cuz that when you look at that movie at the end of the day, more than any other Star Wars film in the saga, like in the nine film saga, Rise is about two characters it's like every every other one of the movies is an ensemble piece but that one really really zeroes in on just those two characters and nobody else has like an arc or really anything important that happens and it's it's a bit of a shame but um but yeah there's a lot of it there's a lot about the stormtroopers that are on uh like the first order stormtroopers that are on uh uh Kefbeer. 
Um, and uh, like, and I think that there was a lot more shot of that as well. Um, uh, that actually like may have explained a little bit about what was going on and maybe had a little bit more of that stormtrooper rebellion that people were looking for with Finn. But I, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, man, that movie is such a nightmare. It's like so many great ideas <laughs> and, and I, and all of the great ideas are kind of like shunned and like kicked to the side in favor of a very bad storyline about Ray being Palpatine's granddaughter. Mm. Like if you could, if you could, if you could just erase that part of the movie and, and, um, tell the rest of the story and like focus back in on the other characters, I think that there's probably, there was probably a good movie in that first, like in that, in the, in the, in what they originally shot, but then all of the reshoots, 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 reshoots. Mm. Oh my God. Nightmare. What a nightmare. Um, but yeah, the, the visual guide actually kind of rescues a couple of elements of that movie for me because it 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 elaborates on things that the film just absolutely glosses over or cuts out entirely um uh, a lot of the exegol stuff is just cut out entirely that's where a lot of the background of of the fact that like it, there is nothing in the film to tell you that that planet that the movie opens with is mustafar mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Because how would you know? How would anyone know? No one would know. Right. Because there are trees growing. There are these people there that he's fighting and like none of it has any context. Even even if you read the um, uh, what's the novel, the it's not Rise of the Resistance because that's the ride, but um, Resistance Reborn, um, the, which is like the novel that's like the lead in novel that's supposed to fill in the gap between Last Jedi and Rise. Um, and it, and it, it, it really doesn't, uh, it's a good novel, but it really doesn't help you, uh, with anything like it, that would have been a great place to give some context of like what Kylo Ren was doing and, 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 you know, looking for the Sith wayfinder and all of that. Like it just, man, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. But then you read the visual guide and it explains, this is Mustafar. What happened is after, vader and palpatine like after vader's castle or like after after palpatine died and vader left the planet started to heal right like like without the dark side influence like it's it's almost um it's actually like it correlates a lot with what happened in acolyte right i i with the with the virgins there um and then it's like like uh palpatine and and vader were sort of like imposing the dark side on this planet and once they were gone once once vader died um and his presence wasn't sort of exerting itself on the planet anymore it started to heal and it's like like uh ecologically like it started to grow plants again and wildlife started coming back and like so there's like a whole thing there um that that is established in something else. It's established, I think, in the comic books. I uh, that got like pulled in to the film, um, as like this is where the Sith Wayfinder would be. But it's like <laughs> this is this is sort of this is sort of actually tied into my point. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it back to you in a second, but okay. but this yeah, is yeah. kind of tied into my point where like I think the movies are the least effective way to tell Star Wars stories because Star Wars is really cool when you can be weird. It's really cool when you can get like into this esoteric um like like world building lore stuff as long as it's also story driven and character driven um like that stuff is really cool and the movies just oftentimes don't have enough time to get into that and rise of skywalker is such a perfect example of that because you're on this first off you have a limited runtime that the film can be and second like like production schedules are what they are right and and movies cost a lot more money than any of the other mediums that we're going to talk about so the ability to tell a story effectively is really really handicapped by those facts and and that opening of rise is such a perfect example of it because originally kylo ren is meant to go into Vader's castle um, in order to sort of like find clues that take him to this creature called the eye of Webbish bog. That was like, 
it's like this parasitic spider thing that's like attached to this giant baby inside of a swamp, right? Like this weird baby alien thing that it was like on the, and the art book shows you what this was supposed to be. And they apparently filmed a bunch of it. Um, they filmed the Vader's castle stuff. They filled the, the webbish bog stuff, but I, for whatever reason, it, like they 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 just have Kylo Ren running through a forest, chopping people up, and then he just opens a sarcophagus that just has the the Sith wayfinder in wayfinder, it. yeah. And it's like it, what could have been fifteen minutes of the coolest cold open in Star Wars, right? Because if you think of it as like an Indiana Jones cold open starring kylo ren on the search for this sith wayfinder like what a great way to open a star wars movie what a what a fucking incredible opening to a star wars movie right and what what it gets cut down to is this five minute thing and why so that we can have more time to to i don't know talk to palpatine about Ray being his granddaughter because that's not in the original screenplay FYI for everybody that doesn't know that that's not in the original draft so what they shot before reshoots what that was never part of it all of that all of the Ray being Palpatine's granddaughter is is reshoot stuff and it's mostly um, Adam Driver and it's mostly I I in in his dialogue in his helmet if you really go back and you look at the way that that movie plays out you look at ray's reactions to stuff there's a there's a whole bunch of it that it's like she could be reacting to like 15 different things Mm -hmm. right she doesn't she never specifically says no i'm not your granddaughter right like she never she never has like a specific reaction to that news all of it (laughs) all of it comes from ADR dialogue. I, I'm pretty sure I'd have to watch it again, but I'm pretty sure all of it is like ADR dialogue with, with Kylo Ren, Adam driver. Right. Um, that, that like contextualizes what's happening. Um, and which obviously is also, you know, informed by, by some of the stuff that Palpatine says and does, but yeah, those like the, the, the reshoots and then like that dialogue is like rumored reportedly what what we have come to understand it was basically like adr dialogue that that adam driver recorded in a hotel closet like a month before the movie came out and so like like that's how that's how close to the release of the film they were deciding a pretty major plot point and a pretty major important piece for a for a character story um i like the legacy of a of a of a character that i that you've sort of like pinned a lot on like i i don't know to me it's it's one of those things where it's like i really think that if this was a good decision that there would have been more conviction and it would have come a lot earlier but the fact that it was like a that it was like a last minute like oh let's do this sort of thing it's like yeah i don't know it yeah it among the many things that don't work for me in rise of skywalker that is one of them but that's that's a thing that happens as a as a constraint of making movies right so um that's why i put it near the bottom of the list honestly like like all of those other mediums have their have their drawbacks i honestly i think that i think that tv shows live action tv is possibly the worst suited um, really yeah i i and then film is like right above that which is like so antithetical to how people consume star wars in mm. the general public but then if you talk to the general public about their opinion of star wars it's actually quite low <laughs> right like it's like a lot of people would put star wars currently under the mcu and the mcu is not rocking so hot these days either yeah. right um And, and I think that the reason why I would say that, that TV is at the bottom for me is that, um, you have to do one of two things. You either have to slash the budget and, and 
the Star Wars of it kind of suffers as a result because I don't think that anybody's really creatively figured out a way to do a Star Wars show on a on a smaller budget. Um, or you have to inflate the budget, at which point there's no way for the show to be successful from a from a financial standpoint, meaning that we get one season of Acolyte, which is establishing an incredible story. I mean, it's an incredible story in and of itself. Like it's a very, it's a very great self-contained story, but it establishes all of these characters and puts them on a path where we absolutely want to see what happens next. And I don't think that we're going to get to because of how much money it costs to make a season of the acolyte. So, you know, unless somebody can figure out a Star Trek business model for making Star Wars shows that works. I I just don't think that that live action Star Wars television is is a good path forward. I don't know. That's not to say that what we've gotten hasn't been incredible, right? I think Acolyte is some of the best Star Wars we've ever gotten. I think that Obi-Wan Kenobi is an incredible show. I love it for the story that it tells. But what I just talked about, that budget stuff, is a major reason why that show doesn't hit with a lot of people because they can't see past the budget stuff um, and the constraints that that story is told under in order to see like, you know, like the important thematic stuff that's going on with Obi-Wan and Anakin and, and Leia. Right. Um, Cause I think that story is absolutely worth telling. I just think like if you did that in an animated form, you could have done 10 times more story than what you did. Um, and given, given so many things, so much more time to breathe. Right. I, uh, and, and, and you'd be way less constrained by, you know, I, uh, I, uh, time periods uh, all you know like that so like we got to do all this stupid you know de-aging stuff in order to tell some of these stories um we don't we don't we don't <laughs> we right don't. But, they choose but they to. do we don't we don't we yeah really i don't i mean i'm thinking specifically when it comes to obi-wan right like they sure. they they want to sure. they want to do the clone wars flashback stuff and in order to do that there's a certain amount of the de-aging that has to go into it right mm. um I think I think what you then see in Ahsoka is that like ah we don't have to worry about it as much as we thought, right? Like like because I think that they do a lot in in Obi Wan with the Attack of the Clones era flashback, but then when we see Ghost Anakin, which you get a little bit more leeway on because he's a ghost and not like it's you're in the world between worlds, it's not literal. Yeah, it's, it's it's darkly lit, which like, yeah everything that's darkly lit CGI, like you get away with a lot more in general. Yeah. Yeah. But, but at the same time, it's like in terms of like what you're going to get away with, I think you get away with a lot more when the story supports bringing the character back for whatever Mm -hmm. reason. Right. Um, Which I mean, the the Obi-Wan story supports it, but, but in the world between worlds, Anakin Skywalker talking to Ahsoka, like adult Ahsoka, I think is like, there's a lot more impact there than there is in the interpretive flashback in Obi-Wan, right? Where it's like, well, okay, so what are we getting from this? Right. Whereas like, I think like, it's very clear what we're getting in, in the, the world between worlds stuff with Anakin. But, um, but if you're an animation, you can do whatever you want, right? Like you can flash back, you can flash forward, you can flash sideways. Like it really doesn't matter. (laughs) I, um, and I'll, I'll use Marvel as an example. I know that not everybody else is down for what if I think that of all of the television projects, what if is the most successful for me personally? That's a really fun one. It's really good. Cause the thing about what if is that we can go anywhere we can do anything, mm-hmm. right? Because it's animation and the, the, the sky is the limit. And yeah, there are still budgets to be worried about, but the types of stories that they've told in, in what if with the Marvel characters uh, have been, have been just off the wall stuff um, like crazy things that you'd never get the opportunity to do in live action with, with those actors um, for budget reasons and for even just like getting them to commit to do some of these things. Right. I, uh, and you can jump around to the timeline. You can jump around in multiverses obviously, cause that's what it is. Um, so yeah, like, like, yeah, just points, points in the wind column for animation. Right. Mm. I, but yeah, I just think I think that live action television is 
such a tricky beast as it is that trying to do something as grandiose as a Star Wars story on the scale that the audience expects it to be is a no win scenario. Uh, you're just like, it's a, to me, it's just, it's a bit of a non-starter and I know that it's what everybody wants. Right. But like, I think, I think Mando does it the most successfully in like, in like over the long term, Right. Obviously. I mean, it's the only show that is running over the long term, mm-hmm. but, but, um, but even that people don't understand people don't people don't get and they don't change their expectations for it they they want it to be as good as a star wars movie in terms of like budget in terms of like like special effects you know locations whatever and they don't understand that like guys this is like the equivalent of batman 1966 right like like or or star trek the next generation like that's what it has to be mm. it's a it's a it's a you know, 2020s version of those types of shows. Um, And even then it, because we stick to like 10 episodes, they, they put a lot more budget into each individual episode, but I would rather at this point have 20 to 22 episodes of a show, right. At a lower budget. Um, that is more focused on characters that's more focused on the story and less focused on set pieces and, and ridiculous special effects and that sort of thing. Um, Because I think like, that's kind of what people react to when they're reacting negatively to these shows is Mm -hmm. that because we want to do a big space battle or we want to do a lightsaber fight every three episodes, or we want to do, you know, these alien creatures and, and, uh, uh, ridiculous locations, right. Um, fantastical places that, you know, it, it, we have to condense the story into eight episodes or 10 episodes or six episodes. And that just doesn't give enough opportunity for the characters to have moments. Right. So even, even the animation having 13 episodes in bad batch, I think is better. Right. But let me ask you for clarification on that. Yeah. You're, you're saying because of all of these, like, you know, the big action set pieces and, and like, because those are beats that you kind of like have to include in a star Wars story, that that's the reason that, six episodes isn't enough for character mo- i feel like it's it should be plenty six ep- in on paper six episodes should be plenty for like getting attached to a character and yeah having them grow like yeah, that sounds yes. like a ton of time yeah but you're you saying could, yeah. these other things are almost like getting in the way of it and that's that's like i, mean, I just i'm trying to understand yeah, yeah. okay I think I think it when I when I compare it to Star Trek, which Star Trek is is suffering from a lot of the same issue right now because it's 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 doing like these ten episode seasons at a higher budget with better special effects and all of that sort of thing, right? But Star Trek still remains very focused on character and mm-hmm. and as a result, I think like they're doing it more successfully. Um I I would still even there say like, I would love to get 20 episode seasons. I don't know if 22 to 24 episodes is, is necessary. I think that like 18 to 20 is a nice sweet spot Mm -hmm. in between the like eight to 13 that we kind of have gotten used to in the streaming model. Right. But, um, Star Trek is a good example. Another really good example is the Netflix Marvel series, right? Daredevil, Jessica Jones. I, I, I know that other people don't care as much, but Luke Cage, I think those two seasons of Luke Cage are phenomenal character studies. Um, And if like, if you skipped those, go back and watch them. They're so good. They're so good. Where Luke Cage starts at the beginning of that versus where he ends at the end of season two and defenders is in there as well. As, and, and Jessica Jones. Cause he shows up in that in the first season of that. I I don't think I've watched the second season of Jessica Jones. I don't think he's in it, but um, even iron fist, like, and I know that that's not a, that that's not a, a popular opinion. Uh, I think that iron fist is, is a good show. It just is not what people expected from it um i i have a question that 
from you, my yeah. challenge to you is to answer this in five sentences or less, because this okay. is going to be an insane tangent. Why were none of those characters in the MCU after they made it seem like, yeah, we're connecting everything to the MCU? Like, that was my understanding when they were like, we're bringing in Luke Cage and Iron Fist and Daredevil yeah. and Punisher. They're all part of the same universe. And then none of those characters showed up until, I think, what, Matt Murdock showed up in Spider-Man at some point. Yeah. But, like, they made it seem like, yeah, this is all tied and connected. Why, why did that not happen? Why weren't they at the end of Endgame when everybody got together to fight? Yeah, I uh, they were called shots that didn't pan out. OK, that's okay. if you want it in one sentence, okay. th that's okay, what it is. Yeah. They were called shots that didn't pan out. Um, Yeah, I, I, I think that 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 Marvel, Kevin Feige, Disney, Netflix, well, like they 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 bit off more than they could chew. Um, and I think that fan reaction didn't match with the expectation that, okay. that Disney had set. Um, and so those characters were kind of dropped except for daredevil who gets to come back mm -hmm. you know yeah i guess to really in, come in back. his fashion yeah yeah and now he's getting his own show so like I, and we'll see we'll see what that means for everybody else but i yeah like those those shows i think are a really great example of what you can do with a few more episodes than mm -hmm. what star wars has been giving itself i think even like andor is a really great example within star wars of what you can do when you give yourself a little mm -hmm. bit more breathing room yeah um, absolutely because i I think like those are much better written television episodes than anything else. Like I, I like, I'm not, I know that I have my opinions on Andor um, and, and where it fits in star Wars. That is not to say that it is not easily the best written of the TV shows, like easily <laughs> hands down by a long shot. It's the best written of the TV shows. I think Acolyte, is the next one. And even for like Acolyte is not as close as, as I, uh, uh, as Andor is the problem with Andor is that in order to do that, they issued a lot of the things that make star Wars, star Wars. And that's kind of getting to my point, right? Is that like, you want to maintain what makes star Wars, star Wars, sure. but in order to do television successfully, you have to you have to sacrifice some element of what makes Star Wars Star Wars, right? Um, and and you know like like I think that Acolyte would have benefited from another two or three episodes, but they couldn't do it because the budget per episode was so high, mm. right? But I do think that having just a little bit more time for I uh, for Osha um, to uncover a little bit more of of what was driving her uh would have been of great benefit to her eventual turn mm -hmm. i think having a little bit more time to establish the relationship between the four jedi that end up you know sort of se separating and and exiling themselves i think i think doing like having a little bit more of like a lost style uh form of storytelling for those characters would have been better like kelnaka is nothing in that show right yeah. Kel kelnaka yeah. is a is a wookie and that's it right we know nothing about what drives kelnaka what kind of jedi kelnaka was right like i i so that like when i look at a show that i really 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 love um and that really like hits all of the star Wars beats for me um, in, in perfect mixture, right? Weirdness, aliens, uh, romance, drama, action, comedy, all of it perfectly balanced. Um, there are still things that I look at Acolyte and go like, it would have been really nice. It would have been really nice if I cared when Kelnaka dies. I don't, right. It would be really nice if I, if I cared more about Torben and and mm -hmm. Indara's relationship um, and how Soul is upsetting that with his presence, right? Mm -hmm. It would be really, really nice if we got just a little bit more background on Soul so that we could understand exactly what kind of Jedi he was and how flawed he was. Because the great thing about that show is getting us getting that character established as this great Jedi. Um I Qui-Gon vibes up and down, right? only to uncover by the end of it that actually like no 
reverse Qui-Gon, opposite Qui-Gon, right? Like uh, inverted Qui-Gon story where it's like, cause Qui-Gon very much is like, is like, I don't care what the council has to say. I am going to train Anakin because I believe that this is the will of the force. Whereas soul is like, I am imposing my own personal, whatever motivation on the will of the force in order to, to, you know, meet my own ends. And, um, and, and, you know, like the council is going to help me cover it up. <laughs> right. Like, like they're like, it's, it's so much the opposite, but he's presented early on as very much Qui-Gon coded, right. For that reason, like for that very reason, cause that's an awesome sort of heel turn for the character. It would be even better if we learned more about soul as a Padawan, um, who his master was and how he came to, to, to be the character that he is by the time that we we're seeing him um, and something to inform some of the, the shadier things that he's doing and uh, for us to understand, okay, there's some deep trauma in this character that he, that is unresolved that the Jedi are ignoring. Right. Um, Cause that's kind of the point of the story. So, you know, and, 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 and this is sort of the point of the whole conversation is like, what do I say when we're talking about quality Star Wars, right? Great Star Wars makes other Star Wars better, mm-hmm. right? That's all like, that is my metric that that's, yeah. that is what I'm measuring. Um, when, when you ask me like, it, is it a good Star Wars story? Is this a good movie? Is it a good book? Is it a good comic? Right. When I look at the Marvel comics, the current Marvel comics, I don't feel that there's very much happening there that is improving the quality of other Star Wars stories. Mm, Every once in a while, you'll hear a nugget and you're like, okay, cool. Um, But is there really anything in there that's improving Star Wars on a grander scale? Mm. When I look at the Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order and Survivor games absolutely like to such a degree like what an exploration of the night sisters of um of of the inquisitors of i you know order 66 even order 66 what it means to be a jedi what the what it means to follow the will of the force right like i and in survivor you know like like the 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 fight against the dark side and how a good character can very easily slip because mm-hmm. i think the third game is going to be about cal falling to the dark side and 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 a struggle to to come out of that um i uh, cuz that's kind of what the second game sets up so yeah like like great star wars makes other star wars better it allows us to look at other star wars with a new lens uh to add new things to it um, and and get more context. That's Obi Wan Kenobi is a successful series because now I cannot watch the original trilogy without every single second that Leia is on screen thinking about that story mm-hmm. and how that story maybe more than anything else that we know about Leia's past made her General Organa. Right, made her the woman that is able to grab that blaster from from Luke, and you know somebody's got to save our skins. That's that's that was from Obi Wan. That's well, it's from it's from that show, right? Because part of it comes from Obi Wan Kenobi himself. A big part of it comes from Tala, right? She, like Leia putting that holster on at the end of the show that was Tala's holster and what Tala stood for and the risks that she took and the sacrifice that she made, I think is so integral to who Leia is as a character that as I talk about it right now, like it makes me emotional, Hmm. right? Cause that character, like Tala is such a great character that we get to live with so briefly. Um, Again, if we had, two or three more episodes Mm -hmm. think about how much more we would know about that character how much clearer it would be that there was a little bit of a thing a little bit of a of a of a of a tension and a chemistry between her and obi-wan um i i and how much better it would have been when she does sacrifice herself and obi-wan is once again on the receiving end of that trauma (laughs) right Mm -hmm. um but what does he do with it this time because i because i really think that that's one of the important parts of obi-wan kenobi is like you know when satine dies obi-wan 
reacts in one way. Um, when Anakin falls and Padme dies, he reacts in another way. And, and um, I mean, even go back, it's, I guess it starts with Qui Gon, right? With, with Qui Gon's sure, death and, yeah. and the way that and the way that he reacts to that. So it's like, how does how does Obi Wan Kenobi process grief, right? Um, and the way that he processes Tala's death and sacrifice is so different from any of those other ones because of the journey that he goes on, right? So it's like like that all that stuff. It's like that's what makes good Star Wars. The shows have managed to do it. Like they've been successful. So it's when I say that they're at the bottom, it's not that I, these, this isn't a quality judgment, right? This is a matter of like, which one of these mediums sets you up for success, Mm. right? Which one of them has inherently the qualities required in order to tell a good star Wars story. Um, And I just think that telling live action television stories is at such a disadvantage over any of the other mediums that I have to put it at the bottom. Um, <laughs> just because like, like the expectation is so high, but the ability to meet that expectation is so difficult. It's so difficult. Um, and I really don't think that anything has and, or is the closest one to being able to do it on, on a larger scale, like with a general audience. But then when I talk to people about Andor especially when I talk to like non star Wars fans, right? Like people outside of the community, what they talk about loving so much about that show are things that I don't think are associated with star Wars very heavily. I like that. Like, like I say over and over and over, it's a really great blade runner show, right? Like uh, talking about imperialism and, Mm -hmm. and um, how that's driven by money and consumerism and all that. And, and it ties into some stuff from, from the Mandalorian, really smartly um but yeah it's it yeah it's 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 such a it's such a difficult thing to talk about with people because it is very much like okay cool so you like the things the things you like about andor are 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 not star wars things and the things that you dislike about the other star wars shows are the star wars things so what you're telling me in that is you don't actually like Star Wars that much, right? And having that conversation with people, some people that I've had that conversation with, they're like, huh, okay, interesting, <laughs> right? And it's like, it's okay. Like, you can still like Star Wars, but if you tell me that, like, you like the dark, edgy, gritty, noir aspects of of Andor, but that, like you hate Jar Jar Binks with every fiber of your being, I think maybe Star Wars actually isn't for you. Like, <laughs> like how many of these other Star Wars things have you bounced off of for similar reasons? Well, then I hate to break it to you. It might not be the, the, the franchise for you. I think, I think there are other things where you'll have more fun. Like I think, I think Blade Runner and the alien movies are probably more your speed. That's what, that's, that's what you're looking for. Um, and I can recommend a whole bunch of sci-fi and fantasy for you that is along those lines, but yeah, like, like, um, yeah, it's just like, that's, that's an interesting thing that I keep coming up against and it's because of the TV shows. Like that's what that's what has started that conversation more often than not, because everybody feels like they need to watch them, but then they don't really like them. <laughs> right. Um, like the people who will watch and or and say that they love it and then turn around and tell me that Mandalorian isn't for them. And it's like, well, what is it about the Mandalorian? Uh, it's a little bit too goofy. It's a little bit too silly. <laughs> like it's a little bit too campy. And I'm like, well, I like, listen, Ewoks are not a serious concept. Yeah. Ewoks are a subversive comedic bit to make a point about, you know, like, like, you know, don't, don't underestimate the little guy. Right. I, I, and that's honestly, that's at the core of star Wars. So if you don't vibe with that, if you can't get down with that, there's a lot of star Wars that's, that's going to bounce off of you. If that's not your speed. Um, and that's fine. Right. But yeah, like t- TV, I just think like is, is like I said, it's just at such a disadvantage. And then right after that is film because with the movies, there's just not enough time. There's not enough time to tell as good of a star Wars story as you can tell in other formats. So um, you want to talk about video games though. And I kind of like, I, I kind of stole a little bit of your thunder by going <laughs> into okay. to fall in order, but, but I want you to, I want you to take over for a little bit. Cause I, I yeah, just sure. talked a lot. 
about about sort of my thesis on this and then <laughs> and then i think then we can come back really quickly talk about comics and novels sure. but then yeah. wrap it up with the with the animation thing yeah cool i mean look this is video games in general right like uh, other than being fun to play like i th- i think one of the core important things you need to nail in a video game is immersion right and star wars has such a like a wonderful i don't even know how to articulate it It, it's just like leaving our galaxy to go to the star wars galaxy is like one of the most like one of the big draws to star wars right is because it's so different but similar but like just getting to, to visually kind of be there and experience it is is just something that's just I don't know, man. Like it, I, it, it's really one of the biggest draws of Star Wars to me. And just, you know, the budget of a video game, whether it's Star Wars or something, you know, that takes place in our world or a fantasy world or whatever, like all of those assets for the most part need to be created, right? So you're really, depending on how big your budget is, of, of course, your budget's always going to matter. But for a Star Wars game, for the most part, the budget's always going to be there. Like the a lot of these companies realize that, okay, if we're putting together a Star Wars game, we really need to <laughs> not be cheap with it. Um, so the, I feel like the budget has never really held too many Star Wars games back. But for me, the draw of that, you know, of a Star Wars video game is that not only am I just there, like I, I f- you know, it's so easy to feel like I'm in this galaxy now. I'm the one making the decisions I'm the one, you know, kind of, uh, you know, it it's the plot's being moved by me. It's not just yeah. happening. I'm not just along for the ride. Like I'm the one deciding, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So many Star Wars games, even, you know, is it perfect? No, but like so many of them even give you the option. Do you want to, do you want to be light side? Do you want to be dark side? Mm-hmm. Um, You know, then you have games like Star Wars Outlaws, where like this is the game I've waited my whole life for and didn't like realize it until I was playing it, Um, where, you know, you don't have to be a Jedi to still have an insane Star Wars adventure. Um, I don't know, man. It's, It's just being in that galaxy, getting to dictate what you do when you do it. And just just the luck that we've had so many like awesome yeah. Star Wars stories told to us with so many like awesome characters. And, you know, part of the magic of video games, too, is that every game is going to be different. Um, and it goes back to my favorite Star Wars in general is anthology. Star Wars is always the most fun to me. Like, I love my my big, you know, narrative arc Star Wars. But for me. Star Wars is at its best. Like the Star Wars I enjoy the most is anthology Star Wars, where all these different creators can kind of come in and bring something different to the table and like do their spin on things. And, yeah. you know, some stories are going to be funny. Some stories are going to be scary. Some stories are going to be exciting and energetic. Some are going to be pulled back and low key. And, and I don't know, man, like I just I, I love that aspect of Star Wars video games is that every Star Wars video game is going to be totally different. And, and you get, to, you're, you're the person like it's, it's you understand the character motivations better than anybody because you're the one making the decisions. Um, you know, not every, like I said, not every game is full blown, you know, mass effect or anything where like you really have more influence over large events of the story itself. But you know, it's, it I feel like it hits home a little bit harder when you're the one getting shot at, right? Like you're the one, you know, deciding, okay, these are the things that I want to prioritize. Um, so it's just, it just works really well for me. And that, that probably also comes from the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm I enjoy video games at large in general. It's like, it's, I'm not just playing Star Wars video games. Like this is just something about video games that I, appreciate like from the ground level like this is all already something that i enjoy and the fact that 
we get to do this in the Star Wars galaxy, and there's so many games that do it well. It's just like, oh man, this is. I always feel like I'm eating well with Star Wars games. You know, even even when there is, you know, there was a couple of years where there just wasn't a lot being released. Um, but I feel like it's going well now. You know, and that's not to say that the games are perfect. Like even the modern games are not perfect. But man, I don't know. I really liked the the single player in Star Wars Battlefront 2. I really love the story in Star Wars Outlaws. Obviously, uh, Jedi Fallen Order, Jedi Survivor are are pretty well liked by the public and critics. Um, so, you know, and you already kind of articulated why they work so well. Um, but then you go back to, you know, simpler games like Dark Forces, Jedi Knight, like, Jedi Knight was, I, I feel like, one of the first games to ever give you that opportunity to make your own decisions. And then you have, uh, you know, I would argue, Republic Commando is the first time we ever saw clones with personalities. And they mm-hmm. they they executed it in a way that, you know, we didn't have D. Bradley Baker at the time, who was, you know, a master class in voice acting and, and portraying characters. But, you know, they made, I think, a very intelligent decision to only have Tamora Morrison as you, the first person character, you know, clone commando boss is voiced by Tamora Morrison, but everybody on your squad is voiced by a different voice actor with a different tone that to a clone trooper, this is what they hear. They, you hear the voice and you understand exactly who the character is, you know, which character is, is which based on their personality and their performance. Um, And then they told this like cool little tactical you know, clone trooper story. And like, they had all this different personality and there was this, you know, there's nothing mind blowing about the story, but like it, it, it just kind of led the way for the kind of stuff we would get later where clone troopers really do have that individuality. So it kind of goes back to your point that each one of these stories, not just makes Star Wars better, but kind of paves the way for better Star Wars later too. Um, yeah, I mean that that's kind of my feelings on on Star Wars video games. I don't know if you have anything to yeah. add. I'm sure you do. <laughs> Cuz of course you're I a lot more um, articulate and well thought about about things than I am, but yeah. I think I think I think one of the reasons why Star Wars video games are so high up on this list for both of us is because it gives us the opportunity to engage with the different elements of Star Wars at at the pace that we choose, like the really good ones. Right. So I'm thinking of, of outlaws. I'm thinking of the Jedi games. Uh, I'm thinking of like the, the, the dark forces games, even to a certain degree. Um, I Knights of the old Republic, right. The, the games that are a little bit like, yeah, yeah. the games that are a little bit more open, give you the ability to explore the, um, like the background and the lore. Mm-hmm. aspects of star wars so like like outlaws uh the jedi series uh the kotor games like there's a lot in those games to walk around and mm-hmm. find right yeah. that exploration yeah. part of it and if you don't want to do that you don't have to do that like you can you can absolutely skip those parts if that part of star wars is not interesting to you um, you don't have to read the codex entries you don't have to search out every little data you know, spike thing or whatever, whatever the collectible is in the game. That's like, you know, okay, let's go, let's go hunt these down. And they just give us little, I mean, like in outlaws, there are radio dramas, uh, hollow Knight yeah. dramas that, yeah. that, uh, I, I collected them, but I have not listened to them because I'm not that interested in what these weird melodrama stories are, but other people love them. Um, and that's exactly the point. Right. Is that like I can choose to engage with the parts of that that I want to and I can ignore the other ones that I don't um, uh, unless I'm trying to platinum a game, then in which case, you know, I'm going to I'm going to grab all the stuff. But um, like you can you can take that part, you can take the action, you can take the story and you can sort of like digest them at the pace that you want to. And I think that that because star Wars is such a, such a world. Um, and the, the brilliant thing that George did when he created it, working with Ralph McQuarrie was to make it feel 
authentic to make it feel lived in right and to give us that that element of it where you really felt unlike the sci-fi and fantasy that had come before with maybe the exception of star trek it didn't really feel like that was a place i could go right um it, they 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 felt like you know star trek was doing its best at the time right with the technology that it had and the and the budget but um the enterprise felt like a place you could go the enterprise felt real back mm-hmm. in the day but the but the alien worlds were just sets in a tv show right but star wars i think was really the first time that one of these worlds was presented in a way where it was like tatooine's another planet and it's not it's tunisia right like they just filmed in the desert but the way that george presents it on screen it feels like a legitimate other world yeah with the aliens and the spaceships and the vehicles and the creatures and the Jundland wastes are not to be traveled lightly. And you know, like the, they, they were frightened off, but they'll soon return it in greater numbers. And it's like, like, like just these little bits of dialogue as uh, Jawas, filthy creatures, right? Like, like just these little tiny bits of things that we just, we just get kind of drip fed it over the course of, of the first third of that movie. That, allow us to believe that this is a real place. And then from the visual design standpoint, like I said, with Ralph McQuarrie, it's like, you know, like, but that through to the, to the people who actually made the sets, made the creatures, made the effects and all of that sort of stuff. I, it just, it, it ends up being this place that we believe is real, that we believe we could go to, even though we know it's fake. We know it's a made up movie story world. Right. Um, and then the video games give us the opportunity to live that out. Like that's like, that really is, I think the most important part, uh, you know, like in a way that even going to galaxy's edge and walking around Batu, which is very cool. It's very fun. I guess that's another medium that we really haven't yeah, talked technically, about. Technically, Cause there is storytelling. Out there is storytelling like happening there. Right. Yeah. Um, and I guess at large that that star cruiser thing, right? The galactic. Star oh, you know what? Is. I'm going to revise my list a little bit. That is absolutely the worst one. Like that, <laughs> like that of, of Dude, all of be the careful. ways people who have experienced it. Yeah, it's like a cult. Like it's a little but, scary how like. But exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Right. Yes, that starship hotel. I'm sure was an incredible experience. Mm-hmm. It was only available to a limited few it was a very elite thing which means it is not an accessibility is a very important part of storytelling Mm -hmm. you need to be able to access the story in order to to partake in it right like in order to be a part of it storytelling is a community activity it is not solitary i know that we like to sit alone with books and tv shows and video games but you're listening to this podcast right now for a reason. And that is because stories are communal. They are, they are part of the fabric of our society. If you can't experience it, if you have to, if you have to, to only get it secondhand from somebody who was lucky enough to go uh, lucky enough to experience whatever, then like, then that's a failure. That's a failure. At least with the TV shows and the movies, they are accessible. Almost anybody <laughs> can can access those things, right? Um, the the limitation on that is is uh, not a construct of the medium, but a construct of society. So, I I yeah, like like uh, capitalism. Um, but yeah, the, yeah, those are definitely that's definitely at the bottom. It is not the ideal way to experience story. Um, uh, it is a very fun way to experience story. It's a very engrossing way, but the same things that are great about that are available in a game like star Wars outlaws and, and, and it's much more accessible in star Wars outlaws and it's actually much better executed. And even though I am holding a controller and looking at a TV screen, as opposed to being physically in a place, I am much more engrossed and I am much more in that world in those experiences than I am in the theme parks. 
with the, with the theme park experience. Mm. Um, and I, and you, I, I think everybody listening to this should know, like, I love theme parks. I love that experience. I love going out. The first time I played Sabacc was in a theme park, but the best times I've played Sabacc are in star Wars outlaws. So, you know, like it, it, yeah, I, I, we went to a casino this past weekend for real, by the way. And I, 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 most of the table games at this casino were absolutely just scams. They were just shell games, right? Like you just give us money and then here are three cards and then here are my cards and that's it. That's the end of the game. Did you win? Um, but, but I did get to play blackjack, just like the most like standard version of blackjack that they had, which they called, I think free bet or something like that. But um, so there were some like additional rules and some like, some 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 things to obfuscate it and confuse you and get you to waste your money but um i did sit down at that table with 20 walked away with 75 and at one point was up to 150 dollars. so <laughs> i i my confidence playing sabacc in star wars outlaws where granted the tokens allow you to alter the game significantly, but are part of the mechanic of the game. But then also you can cheat. There are three different ways that you can cheat in Sabacc in the game. Um, I, that, that definitely give you the advantage over the other players. But um, even still before I had access to those cheats, I, I, or even understood how to use them. Um, I, I was still wrecking shop in Sabacc and, 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 it was pretty hard to beat me even when the computer had a, uh, an actual, like, cause there's a, there's one mission in that game where you have, where the computer clearly has like a, a programmed advantage and I still beat them. I, <laughs> cause I think you're supposed to lose to them the first time that you play and then come back and, and beat them. But I just beat them on the first time out. I, yeah. Like if they, if they, I said to crystal and I was like, if they had Sabak. I'd be getting kicked out of this place. They'd be like, no, no, you can't play anymore. <laughs> Cause I just be, I just be <laughs> cleaning up. Um, I, and playing blackjack and doing as well as I did at blackjack. I, which is itself like a very stacked game in favor of the house. The thing about Sabak is that it's a game that was made up for fun for star Wars. Mm. It was not made up by casinos in order to, to make money. <laughs> Whereas like blackjack and poker are very much co-opted by by the casino industrial complex um, to get you to, to waste your money. So like they would never put Sabak in a casino because th- there are way too many opportunities for the player to win um, over the house. Um, and the way that it's presented in star Wars outlaws, the, the house doesn't win. It's you're just playing against other players, but I, yeah, um, I, I, if it were, if there was a way they, they'd break it. They, they would add additional rules and it would be a different version of Sabacc where you, it's impossible to win, but I uh, standard Kessel Sabacc as it's played in star Wars outlaws, I would destroy it. And being good at blackjack confirms that for me. Um, I, but it, it, it confirms it in a way where I'm like, don't get cocky. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, cause like I said, I went to I I put down twenty bucks at the table. I walked away with seventy five, but at one point I was up to like one hundred and fifty dollars, mm. right? Which means that I lost seventy five dollars there. Right. Like if I had walked away with the <laughs> one fifty, I would have had one hundred and fifty bucks, sure. right? I would have been one hundred and thirty dollars up. But but um, but then you know like because I got blackjack on one hand, I I which is the obviously the best. T- it's like getting sabak in sabak. Mm. And I, uh, or is it the other way around? Maybe, perhaps. Um, I, point of view, all of that. Uh, focus determines reality. Yada yada yada. <laughs> I, but yeah, like 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 that. That it just it makes me go like this is dangerous. This is the, I see how this is dangerous. Um, but it's so funny because like Star Wars is the thing giving me context for that. <laughs> it's like I don't want to lose the Millennium Falcon to Han Solo. Um, I, so I'm going to walk away now with my $80 and then, and then go spend it <laughs> somewhere else with on actual things. Uh, I bought a hoodie and sweatpants actually <laughs> with that money <laughs> that I won. Um, I, but yeah, I, I, 
but the video games give us the ability to do that in a way that that really nothing else does. The theme parks can come close, but the theme parks are hampered by the fact that it's a communal shared experience with other literal human beings at the same time, which always ruins it. That's what ruins Star Wars Battlefront, though, as well. Right. Like 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 you said, like the story missions in Battlefront 2 are great. Um, the, the, the gameplay in those missions is, is middling to, to awful, but, um, I, but the story itself is phenomenal. The, 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 um, um, oh my God, the, her character name just fell out of my head. I had it earlier. Um, I, I. Oh, it's gone. It's gone. But Ooh, that wait, whose name are you looking for? Iden Verso. Uh, Iden oh, Verso. Okay. I, her story is is fantastic. It's great, mm-hmm. and the fact that that character and that and and the, and the other characters and that haven't been explored more is one of the biggest injustices in in Star Wars lately. That's a whole other episode, though. I want to. I do want to do an episode at some point where we like talk about all of the loose threads that Disney has established in all of these different stories that they've told and just ignored, um, because I think that it's like if you want to go after Disney for anything, it's not the stories that they told that they've told. It's the stories that they've yet to tell for fear of like, Oh, well we don't want to, we don't want to waste that one. Right. I, I Luke's lightsaber, Anakin's lightsaber specifically being the biggest one of like, Mm. that's a story for another time. When, when it's almost been a decade. Yeah. It has almost been a decade. Disney care. When, Right, he like, come care. on. He, he's like, yeah, let, let some nerd deal with this. I don't care about this. I yeah. just, I need the lightsaber. Yeah, um, I, yeah, it's so annoying, so frustrating. But uh, that's a whole other topic. So, um, yeah, video games. I video games are 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 definitely my number two. Uh, as as they are for you, I think. Okay, I'm going to cut it off right there because we continue to talk about this topic for a further hour and a half, and we are already at 120 at this point. So uh, tune in to the next episode for the rest of Joe and I talking about uh, the best medium to tell Star Wars stories in. It is a great conversation um, that continues fully into the next episode. And, uh, you know, it's like these are these are two full length episodes. It's not like I'm taking one episode and cutting it in half. Um, we talked for a long time. This was this is a really long conversation. So, um, yeah, I just figured we would slice it in half and uh, I put it out in in two chunks. Um, so look forward to that coming in a couple of weeks. But I, you know what? Here's a little preview of the rest of our conversation. <laughs> The novel doubles down on that and tells that story. I think you chuck the novel. You just pretend like it didn't happen. They they have already done this. Disney has already done this. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you t- you you go back and you you add a little bit more to that story. What I want to see, and the reason why like Zori doesn't trust Poe, is that Leia's first mission. Poe goes and he signs up for for the New Republic, right? Like he like he enlists when he turns eighteen or whatever. Um, and, uh, follows in his, in his mom's footsteps, he's going to be the best pilot in the galaxy. And he is right. But, I uh, Leia clocks him as who he is as Poe Dameron and is like, I need you to go do this thing for me. And is, and like that, that, that the whole thing with Zori was actually, like it was a mission, right? Cause all, cause, cause Poe is older than the other ones. Right. So like I, uh, in the same way that Han was older. So like in the same way that Han can have solo, a star Wars story that takes place well before anything else that we've seen him in, like, like well before we get to, to a new hope, you have the room to tell that story with Poe as well. Um, and Poe and, and Ben are around the same age. The other thing that is massively important to me is to establish that Ben Solo and Poe Dameron knew each other and were in fact friends in their childhood. Okay, that is it. Thank you guys for listening and we will catch you on the next episode. Follow Force Perspectives on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at ForcePOV. And join us on Discord at thunderquack.com slash Discord. 
support the show by visiting us at patreon.com slash thunderquack to get early access to episodes, leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast service, or buy merch at store.thunderquack.com. Force Perspectives is a part of the Thunderquack Podcast Network.